Hello and welcome once again to another Red Gaming Tech video, myself and Marta, where I'm here as always with the latest news from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. We're going to start off today's proceedings with some PC gaming related news from Ubisoft. So they have reported their financials for the first quarter of the fiscal year, yes in July, don't get me started on financial years, they're weird, okay? And one of the things that you can notice from their report is that PC gaming is now their most profitable platform. They have been increasing their focus on the quote-unquote PC opportunity, and it seems their hard work has paid off. They have beat their targets, and again, the biggest platform for the period was PC. So, 34% of net sales on PC were 34% for the quarter, up 10% from the same time last year. And running in second place, we saw the PlayStation 4 at 31%, Followed by the Xbox One at 18, mobile at 7, Switch at 5, and others, whatever that means, at 5%. Now, obviously, because this is PC, unsurprisingly, we saw a significant, and I do mean hugely significant, portion of their total sales come from digital sales this quarter, 93%. Which is crazy. I mean, I know, again, we're talking about PC, where no one really buys discs anymore, but still, crazy. What about the games that actually led this charge? Well, unsurprisingly, there were Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Rainbow Six Siege were among the front leaders there. So, long story short, we can probably reasonably expect some half-decent, if not very good, PC support from Ubisoft in the future as it continues to make them piles and piles of lovely cash. But speaking of PC gaming versus console, our next topic is regarding PlayStation 5's PSVR. You guys have undoubtedly seen the reports doing the rounds about some PlayStation 5 VR patents. I'm not actually going to talk about it, really. I'm just going to direct you to a video that Paul did two months ago, roughly, where he discovered those patents, and these are the exact same patents that are now doing the rounds across the internet. So we have actually already discussed this, but essentially the PlayStation 5 VR specs came out, as well as some eye head tracking eye tracking tech excuse me so if you want the full skinny there will be a link in the description below this video to paul's old video go watch that if you missed the segment so let's move on shall we to amd ryzen now, as you guys probably know if you've been watching my videos for a while sometimes i talk about the reports from minefactory.de which, for the uninitiated, excuse me, is the largest digital retailer in Germany, and they, every month, release detailed reports on who is in the lead versus AMD and Intel. Now, we have a report that pretty much marries up to what Germany are seeing from Minecraft, uh, Minecraft, Minefactory, excuse me, not DE, because we always see, at least for the first few months, Ryzen being in the lead significantly. And then we have a report from Danawa Research, who is one of the biggest retailers in South Korea. And according to the report, which they have very kindly shared, the volume of Ryzen CPUs sold exceeded Intel Core processors just a few days after Ryzen 3000 became available. So as soon as market opened on the 8th of July, which obviously would be the day after the release of Ryzen 3000, CPU sales from AMD witness a huge jump of 48.72% versus 28.24% just a day earlier. And this isn't just like one flash and then it's gone sort of thing, no. This actually continued for a couple of days and the volume of AMD CPUs sold exceeded Intel's just two days later. We saw 53.336 excuse me, percent versus the 46.64% of Intel. Now they also shared some very interesting data as to the amount of clicks on their retail outlet for each brand and basically they're looking at what's drawing the most attention even if the user did end up making a purchase what were most people clicking on going oh do I want to buy that can I save up for this that sort of thing and AMD drew 76.95% of users where only 23.5% were interested in the lineup of Intel. But they went even further than just these facts and figures, which are still very interesting. They went into breakdown of per CPU. So we saw 10.34% of sales go to 3700X. The 3600 has gotten 8.23%. The 2600, which of course is previous gen, um, got 7.5, 3900X at 4.92%, and the 2200G had 3.25%. But what about Intel? 
Well, we saw the nine five, sorry, the i five ninety four hundred get fourteen point five five percent, and the ninety seven hundred K had a nine point eight percent share, which was overtaken by the thirty seven hundred X. As for the flagship 9900K, we only saw 3.85% of the total sales. And just as we have this really, really interesting report, and you will find the source for this linked in the description below this video, we have another one hot on its heels from BCN Ranking, who basically round up data from major outlets in Japan. And we are also seeing AMD gain major ground there as well. We see AMD overtaking Intel's share. They stand at 50.5% versus Intel's 49.5. Of course, that is a very narrow lead, but it is still a lead from AMD. So, very, very interesting stuff. Now, I said last month when I covered the Mind Factory report that I'll be really curious to see what we see happen for their reports. Obviously, it hasn't come out yet. It will be usually around the sort of start of August ish um, that we'll see it. So, be really interesting to see how we see this reflected but it's really really cool just to see the race really heating up across the world uh, as we see the Ryzen 3000 release and the impact on the market truly felt. So let's move over from AMD to Intel now. Now of course it, this became a bit of a meme and to us deservedly so 10nm was delayed and delayed and delayed. And apparently this was due to the company being quote-unquote too aggressive. And this was according to the Intel CEO himself, Bob Swan, who spoke at the Fortune Brainstorm Tech Conference in Aspen, Colorado. And he basically said the 10NM delay was caused by quote, too aggressive innovation and added that at a time it gets harder and harder, we set a more aggressive goal. What does he actually mean by that, I hear you ask? Well, because we've seen Intel stuck for eons on 14nm what are we on at this point 14nm plus 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 so we saw them finally go to 10nm great so it's we're shrinking down the process node cool but that's not the only change they brought there was a bunch of other changes versus the previous architecture as well as the challenges of shrinking the node and they were trying to shrink down further than you would expect on traditional scaling and this is what Intel call hyperscaling. And essentially what Intel was asking of its engineers here was to get a 2.7 times transistor density improvement versus 17 and 14nm, excuse me, sorry. So that's why we are seeing such a heavy delay for 10nm. And I do mean heavy, because let me just refresh your memory. 10nm was originally scheduled for launch in 2015. And it's only just getting a mobile launch this year. So just to put it in a bit of perspective for you as to how overly aggressive Intel actually got. And I think it's just biting off more than you can chew, to be real with you. With all that said though, Intel are not backing down. They are still sticking to their promise to have its own 7nm design in 2021. Now I'm sure they've learned from their mistakes with 10nm. They obviously would rather avoid a repeat of what we saw with the heavy delays to the architecture, as well as of course the pretty severe strain it put on the 14nm supply. Those supply issues caused ramifications across the industry for ages. So they would obviously rather avoid that if they can. So 2021, they're still confident in that but obviously that still puts them behind AMD, who just released their 7nm process. We'll have to see how much that matters in the long run, of course. So we're going to finish things up today with a benchmark for the Super Series. So this comes to us thanks to none other than Tom Apisak, whose name you should be very familiar with at this point. He has posted a series of benchmark scores for Ashes of the Singularity Escalation at 4K at the Crazy Preset. And we have results for the 2080 Tie, 2080 Super, 2080 Vanilla, and 2070 Super. Now you may recall just yesterday Paul covered the fact that we probably aren't going to be seeing a 2080 Tie Super, so go check that out if you haven't already. But what about the benchmarks? Well... For the 2080 Tide, we saw 7,500. The 2080 Super, we saw 6,500. The 2080 is 6,000. And the new 2070 Super is at 5,600. So, we should of course wait for reviews and all of that, but so it's going to be very interesting to see whether or not we do see a 2080 Tide Super. I don't think we will, because again, Paul's video yesterday touches on reasons why this may or may not happen, but it's fairly unlikely, at least at present. 
But it's going to be interesting to see what this card can do when they finally come out. Let me know your thoughts, guys. Are you interested at all in a super card? Or are you going to be sticking and waiting to see what else happens in the GPU market? Or are you perhaps sticking with what we already have or going with AMD? Let me know your thoughts and opinions, guys. As always, your support is highly appreciated. Do remember to like and subscribe. If you haven't done so already, it does help out a great deal. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.